Namaste. Uh, hello from India. My name is Ashish Kothari. I work with an organization called Kalpavriksh in India and also with a global platform called the Global Tapestry of Alternatives. Um, and I'm thanked, uh, thanks a lot for this opportunity to speak about sustainable development goals and uh, what's happening, especially in my part of the world. Um, I think that the SDGs, the framework that came up in 2015, is uh, definitely way better than the Millennium Development Goals and everything else that we've had before that, uh, especially in its very core focus on the environment, ecology, on sustainable production and consumption, on the conservation of ecosystems and so on. Uh, and there are many positive elements to that. Uh, however, uh, there are lots of issues with regard to both the, the framing of the SDGs and how they're actually being implemented on the ground in countries like uh, India. Uh, one of the big issues is that many of the goals are framed in very general terms. And then, of course, they become more specific when we uh, look at the uh, indicators. But then there are only a few indicators and many other aspects that are left out. So what that enables is that countries which are going in a particular direction in, uh, in, in their models of development, especially focused a lot on economic growth, um, can think of themselves as actually following the SDGs, but on the other hand, also be pursuing policies that are in some way undermining the ecological or other aspects of the, of the SDGs. So for instance, here in India, uh, we have uh, we've had many uh, of these what we used to call five year plans and now an annual kind of a planning cycle, uh, which is generally titled as being sustainable and inclusive development. If you look at the, the macroeconomic picture of it, uh, parts of it where the investments are happening and things like that, and what happens in say the environmental sector or the social sector or the human rights sector, there are frequently contradictions between them. Um, as an example, uh, and one of the flaws in the whole system is that none of the economic sectors actually go through an environmental impact assessment. Specific projects do, like a particular mine or a dam or something like that. But say the energy sector as a whole does not go through any kind of social and environmental impact assessment, which means that there can be lots of internal contradictions without uh, those being uh, realized or without them being actually uh, exposed and dealt with. Um, another example of this is that the goals and the activities of some parts of the system could be very contradictory to other parts of the system. So, for instance, uh, the last budget in India, the uh, budget for uh, highways, national highways, was 40 times more than the budget for the Ministry of Environment. Uh, and we know that a lot of these highways actually are going through ecologically very fragile areas or displacing and dispossessing communities in many parts of the country. And there are very few mechanisms by which in fact that can be uh, that can be checked because the dominant narrative is that highways are needed for development and infrastructure. And so anything that comes in its way has to be sacrificed. Um, so these are, I, I can go on, but these are some of the issues. And I, I think other issues that also come up is that the SDGs uh, or at least sustainable development in the way that it gets implemented in a country like India, uh, can also hide a lot of greenwashing. For instance, if you look at our shift from, uh, not from, but our shift to add renewable energy, the so-called clean energy to the fossil fuels, both of which are expanding very rapidly uh, in India. Coal mining is expanding, but also solar energy, wind energy, etc. are also expanding very rapidly. And it sounds good that we actually have a huge renewable energy uh, program. 50% of India's energy is supposed to come from renewable energy. But the problem is that because there is no control on the demand of energy itself, we keep demanding more and more and more energy, especially those of us who are part of the elite circles, the luxury demands and so on. Uh, you have to keep building more and more and more solar projects, wind projects, etc., which also have their own ecological impact. It's not like they're totally clean. Uh, they need mining, they need space, they displace communities, they displace grazing lands and wildlife. Uh, or if you take something like, say, the shift from fossil fuel uh, vehicles to electric vehicles, which is a big thing all over the world. Many of the Green New Deals, for instance, in the United States and Europe talk about uh, how this shift will be beneficial for the climate. But electric cars also need uh, materials and they need energy. That has to come from somewhere. And we know that, for instance, lithium mining or other kinds of mining in different parts of the world is what will feed the huge boom in electric cars in the US and, and Europe. 
And even in India, our prime minister has said we need to shift to electric cars. What we are not asking much more fundamentally is why actually this whole focus on the private car? Why not a much greater focus on public transportation, on cycling, on walking? And in cities in India, there's virtually no focus on these aspects, which are actually beneficial to the environment, but also which most people in the country, including in cities, would be using. Uh, there are very few people who actually, the percentage of people using private cars is very little. Uh, even, for instance, the goals for net zero, where you keep allowing carbon to be emitted and then you kind of capture it somewhere else uh, through technology or through plantations, uh, are again part of what I would call greenwashing or uh, false solutions. They don't tackle the fundamental structures of uh, unsustainability and, and oppression. Uh, and unfortunately, they can all be couched in terms of sustainable development. Finally, I think one of the problems with the SD, uh, with the sustainable development frameworks and how they're being implemented is participation of people. To my mind, uh, no amount of sustainable development is possible unless there's very fundamental and at a very core level from the decision making to the implementation, the central participation of people, especially the people most affected and impacted by any economic decision that is taken. And again, a lot of this is, uh, is tokenism. We have what we call public hearings in India, for instance, but mostly local people don't get to know about them. They're organized in very secretive manner, sometimes even in a violent atmosphere where people are forced to say something that they don't necessarily even want to say. Uh, and as the tendency to authoritarian decision making in many countries increases, we see that this kind of uh, public participation becomes more of, again, a bit of an eyewash rather than true and genuine participation. Of course, that is happening in many other countries, but certainly in places like India, that is still very tokenistic. Uh, so the last thing I'd like to say here and then point and then come to the what I think are the fundamental alternatives to this kind of uh, these kinds of problems um, is that the SDG framework itself, notwithstanding the issues with implementation in specific countries, but the framework as a whole also has internal contradictions and flaws. So for instance, it talks about sustainability, it talks about conservation, et cetera. But on the other hand, one of the goals is economic growth. And many of us now believe, and there's enough evidence to show that continued economic growth is simply not compatible with sustainability. It's a contradiction in terms on a planet that is already overstressed in terms of natural resources and uh, ecological sustainability. So uh, that's one huge problem. The second big problem with the SDG framework is that there's a lot of focus on the nation state, on governments doing things. And of course, that's important and necessary, but not adequate focus on grounded democracy, which is the sorts of examples that I'll give you, where people are in, in control of their own lives and are able to actually take their lives forward uh, in a sustainable manner much better. And the third issue is that the SDG framework is very weak on accountability of corporations. We know that private corporations are the most powerful in the world these days. They control our lives, our economic lives in many different ways. Uh, and yet, uh, we don't actually have a framework which can hold them accountable, which can point to the kind of ecological crimes that any of these corporations are committing all across the world. So what, are, what do we have as alternatives? Because these are uh, some of the issues and the problems that I've, I've pointed out. And I'd like to spend the next few minutes pointing to, um, through a set of slides, to what I think are actually genuine alternatives to this kind of uh, framework. I mean, using, of course, the SDG framework in, in whatever way we can, but how do we go beyond that to address these issues much more fundamentally? I'm not going to go into detail, but we have thousands and thousands of examples around the world of people trying to meet their needs and aspirations while being in harmony with the rest of nature and also creating situations of much more equality, equity, justice uh, within human beings themselves. I am, of course, much more familiar with uh, examples from many parts of the world, but especially from India. And over the last few years, we've been documenting, uh, we have now about 1,800 stories of transformation on the ground in different fields in basic needs like water and energy and food and uh, sanitation and so on, but also on social issues like gender justice and against casteism and on political issues like local governance uh, decision making. So let me give you very quickly a few examples of where uh, we see these transformations working on the ground. Uh, this is uh, an inspiring example from southern India of 5,000 Dalit women farmers. Dalits are the so-called untouchables or the outcasts of Hindu society. 
um, very large numbers in India, 200, 250 million people who have been on the margins of social and economic life for a long, long, long time. And here, these uh, 5,000 Dalit women, farmers, and their families have got together over the last 30 years, bring back into their lives their traditional diversity of seeds to switch completely to organic farming, uh, to do only uh, rain-fed farming and not large-scale irrigation from somewhere else, to share a lot of their seeds, create grain banks, to claim women's rights on the land, which is a very unusual thing in India. And through these and many other collective efforts, actually be able to create food security for themselves. Every one of these 5,000 households now is food secure, but also food sovereignty, which means complete control over everything to do with food, the seeds, the knowledge, the land, the water, etc. So no dependence on corporations and no dependence on the government, uh, at least for something as basic as food. And this, this thing of community sovereignty over basic needs is a very fundamental uh, movement in many parts of the world, which includes also land, it includes energy, it includes water and other things. This is an example from Western India, a village which is uh, it's got multiple different castes uh, and, uh, and, and in a very dry area also, where in the last few years, the local village council, the panchayat as we call it, has been able to mobilize the entire village into uh, making sure that all their health requirements during the COVID pandemic were properly met, that economic activities continued, even as India was facing lockdown, economic lockdown. In villages like this, the economic activities continued, even while maintaining safety, health safety, to make sure that everybody had access to uh, whatever was required during the pandemic, um, and many other aspects that they were able to do. And this is a village which is, you know, it's been it's a shiny example of what is possible when a community mobilizes itself and when it actually gains the power to do things on uh, on its own to create more self-reliance, at least especially for decision making. This is from central India. This is indigenous part of India, or what we call Adivasis. And here, 90 villages have got together to struggle against mining, which was being brought in by the government. They said, no, we don't want mining because mining will destroy our livelihoods and our forests and our water. Uh, we want to uh, uh, take control over all our forests, which they have done legally. They protect that forest. They use it for their own livelihood resources uh, and for their uh, incomes. Uh, and also, simultaneously, a lot of women's empowerment to be equal parts of decision making cultural identity movements, and many other things which these, uh, these Adivasis, these indigenous people are asserting. And again, they're saying the same thing, that in wherever we are, we need to be at the core of decision making. So as they say, we elect the government in New Delhi and Mumbai, but in a village, we are the government. And nobody will take decisions on our behalf. We have to be at the core of decision making. Uh, we go to many examples of cities also around the world. This one is again in Western India of a town where the uh, so-called slum dwellers, the people in the most uh, economically uh, uh, marginalized sections of, of that urban community have been able to again mobilize themselves with the help of some civil society groups to uh, assert their own planning in the city. Uh, for instance, with housing, with water, with energy, uh, with local governance, and to say that the town planning as a whole must happen with that kind of central planning, sorry, participation, of the local communities. It cannot only be done by bureaucrats and politicians at the city level. It has to be done at that decentralized local level. Uh, we've collected lots of stories uh, of where in the last two years of the COVID pandemic, which caused enormous suffering to millions of people in India and elsewhere, uh, where communities were extremely resilient because of this kind of collective mobilization, self-reliance, local democracy, local collective control over natural resources, and so on. So let me end by just giving a little bit of a framework of this kind of uh, overall transformation, which is what we would like to see when we think about how do we go beyond the SDGs. So we're talking about transformations taking place in five spheres of life. There's political, there's economic, there's social, there's cultural, and there's ecological. With the political, it is about people claiming power where they are. So un un unlike the SDGs, which put all their focus on the nation states and on governments, here, people are saying, no, in our villages, in our urban neighborhoods, we will be the decision makers and we will make the government accountable to us rather than them uh, imposing their will on us. When it comes to the economy, workers, people who actually are the producers, whether they're on the farms or the forests or in factories or as craftspersons, 
to be in charge of and to own the means of production rather than capitalists and capitalist corporations. We're saying if we are putting in all the work, why should we not be in control, including to be in control of the markets, to build relationships with consumers which are equal, uh, where I also benefit and they also, the producer and the consumer both benefits, to create much more localized self-reliance instead of economic globalization uh, and so on, and to build an economy of caring and sharing, not an economy where money is what rules, right? It's really about how do we build relationships, social relationships, it's a part of econo economic and, and, and vice versa. But it's also about struggles for equality. We have uh, in India and elsewhere, there are enormous gender inequalities, uh, caste inequalities and class inequalities and so on. So the social struggle, the struggles for social equality, cultural equality are very much part of that. Then there are the, the movements for uh, asserting cultural diversity and knowledge diversity. The SDGs are very clear here that it's about everybody's knowledge, not just modern science and technology, but traditional forms of knowledge also, multiple different forms of knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and the science and technology that comes with all of that, and the multiple cultures, the languages, the cuisines, the ways of, ways of knowing, ways of speaking, ways of doing, the ways of dreaming, which are so diverse across the world, rather than homogenize them, how do we sustain that diversity as a part of this kind of sustainability? movement. Um, and at the core of this, what we call the flower transformation, or here in India, we call eco swaraj, which means autonomy and self-rule with responsibility for other people's autonomy and self-rule and happiness. At the core of this flower is a set of values and principles, which really is uh, the fulcrum of any kind of sustainability or sustainable development or sustainable well-being that we want to talk about. I'm just going to put up uh, these values. We don't have the time. I don't have the time to actually go into these in detail. But just to give you a, a one, uh, two examples. So if you look at that fourth bullet point there, what these alternative initiatives are talking about is cooperation being more important than competition. The commons being more important than private uh, property. Uh, solidarity being very important. We saw that, for instance, during the COVID pandemic, where people had solidarity with each other. They cope much better than where they were individualistic and selfish uh, because of the process of development we have. Uh, or if you take, for instance, um, happiness. Now the uh, corporate system tells us happiness is about going shopping, you no know, retail therapy. But actually these movements are saying, no, happiness is much more about having good social relationships within each other, good family life, good opportunities for learning, a healthy environment, trees and birds and plants outside our house so that we can actually also talk to them. It's not so much about going, of course, we need the material well-being, of course, but that is very different from what the system is telling us that you go shopping, you buy more and more and more and more and bigger and bigger and bigger and faster and faster. But that's not what happiness is about according to these radical movements. Um, they're also saying that it's not just about human rights, but also the rights of the rest of nature. Rivers have rights, mountains have rights, other animals have rights, plants have rights. It's not just human beings. How do we look at ourselves as the circle of life, how do we actually rebuild worldviews that celebrate life, not celebrate money and fame and power? And if in that sense, uh, if you really want to look at sustainable well-being, it's this kind of set of values that we have learned from the grassroots initiatives that need to be promoted. Uh, in India, we have a process that we call alternatives confluence or we call Sangam where we bring a lot of these different kinds of movements and organizations and individuals working on these sort of alternatives together to learn, to collaborate, to build more and uh, you know, further to create new initiatives and to also collectively envision the kind of uh, society that we want, then how do we work towards that? We have a similar thing happening across the world called the Global Tapestry of Alternatives. So we call Sangam here, Kriyanza Mutwa in Mexico, Kriyanza Mutwa in Colombia, the alt dev network in southeast asia etc trying to dialogue with each other learn from each other create more of a critical mass for affecting the kind of change we need both at the ground at the grassroots level but also in the global economic and political system so with that uh, we have lots of uh, publications of course also we where there are lots more case studies and analyses and and uh, conceptual worldviews and so on um, uh, that we have been part of, uh, which has uh, much more documentation on this. With that, uh, I'd like to end. Thank you again for the opportunity. And uh, I would be very happy to be part of further discussions and dialogue on this. Thank you.